Quite a few years ago, if I remember correctly, a wealthy Australian Christian gave some money for an advertising campaign to promote Christianity. In preparation for designing this campaign, market researchers looked into some of the words that are associated with Christianity and what sort of feelings that they generate for people. Words like church, Jesus, gospel, and things like that. Well, the finding that I remember hearing about at the time and which has stuck in my mind is that the word church for a lot of people did not have good associations. And there are plenty of reasons why you might imagine that could have been the case for people. Bad press, uh, bad first-hand experiences people might have had at church, the sense of the church being institutional or organized religion. Anyway, church didn't have great associations for people, but Jesus was still found to be a good brand. According to the research, people had good associations with Jesus. From that research was born the Jesus All About Life campaign in 2009. So Jesus, at least in 2009, was a good brand. Now I suspect that 11 years on, Jesus' brand might not be quite so good. There's more hostility than there used to be. Although even now I think that many people who might be hostile towards church or to organised religion or to supposedly hypocritical Christians are still reluctant to turn their hostility directly onto Jesus. Well, that makes it interesting to read a passage like today's passage from Matthew's Gospel in which we do see open hostility towards Jesus in his earthly ministry and not only hostility but the accusation that he was in fact in league with the devil. It's all prompted by a healing that Jesus performed. Verse 22, they brought him a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute and Jesus healed him so that he could both talk and see. Now, Demon possessed has certain connotations for us which I don't think are very helpful. All that is really being said here in the Bible text is that this man was blind and mute and that the evil spiritual beings who follow Satan were involved. Another translation simply says demon oppressed and I think that that is better. There's no reason why there wouldn't also have been a scientific explanation why this man was blind and unable to speak. But the important point is, no human could heal him then, and perhaps even today, no human would be able to heal him. But Jesus healed him. Jesus healed him effortlessly. So much so that it's not even something that Matthew dwells on. Even though for this man, it must have absolutely transformed his life. What a gift to be able to see, to be able to hear and speak. Of course, those abilities, which you and I mostly take for granted, are also amazingly generous gifts that God gives to us. The people were astonished and amazed and probably even afraid at the power that they saw at work when Jesus did this. It got people talking. Could this be the son of David? And by the son of David, they mean the Messiah, the one that God would send to restore Israel and establish his worldwide rule. People are asking, is this, is this the one? The one we've been waiting for? The, the one who will bring in God's rule of justice and peace? But there's a reluctance in the crowds. The, the tone of the question is almost, well, this can't be the son of David. Can it? Now, who knows why they're reluctant? They've just seen an astonishing miracle. You might think that they're a rather tough crowd. But for whatever reason, this mighty healer is not who they thought the Messiah would be. It's commonly said, and probably rightly, that they are expecting a military ruler. And I wonder whether this reluctant question about Jesus, he's not the Messiah. Is he? Perhaps represents where a lot of people are today. Jesus is certainly a remarkable person, but it seems unthinkable to many that he could really be the Lord. He's ancient. 
He's too supernatural. I mean, surely, for many people, this, this whole thing of treating Jesus as the Messiah and the Lord is, is just something for previous generations. He's not the Messiah. Is he? Well, the Pharisees sensed this reluctant questioning, and so they went in hard to try to stamp out even the suggestion that Jesus could be the Messiah. Verse 24, when the Pharisees heard this, they said, It is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. Now you can see what this is, can't you? It is an extremely brazen statement that Jesus is evil. He's in league with the devil, and it's by the devil's power that he casts out demons. Possibly a good strategy with the crowd, because if Jesus is actually evil, well, a, a, an ordinary person, they don't even want to risk an association with Jesus, do they? They don't even want to be seen dipping their toe in the water of Jesus' teaching, of Jesus' disciples. Now today, you're still not going to get a lot of people brazen enough to call Jesus a devil. But there are some who are definitely bold enough to say that Christianity is, is evil or a negative influence. And there's probably two main reasons for that. First, Bible-believing Christians just simply refuse to toe the woke line on sex and euthanasia and transgender and so on. But, but second, it's because Christianity is fundamentally missionary in nature. We're just not, we as Christians are just not content to, to live and let live. And the reason is because in Jesus Christ, we have got something that is so good that we have to share it. And we're constantly fighting for the opportunity to share it. We're fighting to keep scripture in schools, for example. We do this because we know that Jesus has loved us and we want to share his love with others. We want to do this voluntarily at our own cost. We call this sharing the good news. But others call it proselytizing, which is apparently unacceptable because I'm trying to change somebody's mind. As if there were any such thing as a communication that's not trying to change somebody's mind in some way. So what I'm hoping we'll see is that the suggestion that Jesus is, is actually evil, that suggestion which the Pharisees made in Jesus' own day, it is something that we see around today in a slightly different form. And it makes it interesting to have a look at Jesus' answer. Verse 25, Jesus knew their thoughts and he said to them, every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? Jesus is saying, in effect, that the Pharisees are being completely illogical. It would have been agreed amongst all the people in this conversation that Satan was God's enemy and wanted to destroy God's good works. So, Jesus says, well, look, take a look at this man. Previously, he was blind and he couldn't talk. I have healed him so that he can see and so that he can talk. So according to you, Satan is actively working through me to restore God's creation to the way it's meant to be. Well, if that's the case, then Satan is fighting against himself. Jesus had done something that was obviously good. And the Pharisees have called it evil. Well, that's just illogical, isn't it? It just doesn't make any sense. Now, in next week's passage from the next part of Matthew's Gospel, we will see that it is also wicked to say such a thing. And in the same way, have a look at the fruits of Jesus' work today. The fact is that people who are active Bible-believing Christians who are involved in church, who are reading the Bible, who have an active prayer life, who are involved in Christian fellowship, they have better lives. They're likely to be better off. They're less likely to have problems of addiction. They're less likely to go through a divorce. They're more likely to have a sense of meaning and purpose in their lives, which is better for mental health and overall life satisfaction. 
These are demonstrable facts. Now, of course, you can always find anecdotes that seem to contradict the trend. But overall, if you've got Jesus in your life in a meaningful way, it will be good for you, even in this world, let alone in the next. The gospel is going to make people's lives better. And yet, when we share the gospel, we're made to feel as though we're, we're proselytizing and do, doing something that's, that's somehow harmful. I mean, people are allowed to advertise a betting website. People are still allowed to sell cigarettes. People are still allowed to peddle pornography, all of which are done for profit and which are provably addictive and harmful. It's okay to peddle all that stuff. But if you want to talk to them about Jesus, who will do you good both now and forever, and, you, and I don't stand to profit in any way, those who seek to, to share Jesus with people don't stand to profit from this. Yet somehow the world is uncomfortable that we might be proselytizing. To say that Jesus is somehow doing the work of the devil well, it's ridiculous, isn't it? And so, Jesus says, if it's not so easy to explain me away like that, let's come back to the original question. People are saying, surely this is not the son of David. Surely this is not the Messiah, is it? And so, Jesus says, well, what if I am? Verse 28, if it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. The proof was staring them right in the face. The work of the Spirit of God to heal this man that nobody else could have healed. If this is the work of the Spirit, then the conclusion is unavoidable. The kingdom of God has come upon you. Now, for some, I think the question about the kingdom of God might be, well, hang on a minute, I don't understand that. I don't understand the kingdom of God has come upon you because I thought that God was ruling all things anyway. So what could it mean that the kingdom of God was somehow still arriving in the person of Jesus? The answer is that in the world that Jesus entered 2,000 years ago, and even in the world that we see today, God's rule is not complete. In fact, because of man's turning away from God in sin, God has allowed our world to come under the dominion of the devil. What we see in our world is, is not God's uninterrupted rule of justice and peace. I mean, isn't that obvious? What we have is a world that has come under the dominion of the devil who desires to destroy God's good works. The announcement of the kingdom of God is the announcement that the devil is to be cast out and the world brought under God's perfect peace and justice. When Jesus stepped into our world 2,000 years ago, he showed, for example, through this healing that we've read of this morning, that he easily had the power to destroy the devil's work. He healed the blind and mute man in a flash. It's because he has got the devil tied up. Jesus can take whatever he likes from the devil's grasp. His plan had always been that he would die for sin, rise from the dead, ascend into heaven, send his spirit into the world and his people out on mission to announce the kingdom of God to the whole world so that people could turn to him in repentance, asking for their sins to be forgiven before Jesus comes in glory. Jesus' miracles clearly showed that the kingdom of God had arrived and was arriving through him. So no wonder the Pharisees and everyone under the sway of the devil saw the coming of God's kingdom as evil, because it was a direct threat to their power. If we ever should hear it suggested that Christianity is evil, is harmful, or that Jesus is evil or harmful, well, 
we should see it for the illogical statement that it is. The good news is that Jesus is good and he loves us. He has come to destroy the work of the devil and he is powerful enough to do so. His rule of righteousness and peace has come and is coming. So turn to him in repentance and faith and stay with him because he is good. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we praise you that you are good. We praise you that your son is good. That he did good things in his earthly life, destroying the work of the devil, showing that he is both willing and able to bring in your kingdom of righteousness and peace. Father, we ask you to help us to look forward to that. We ask you, Father, to help us to spread the news that the kingdom of God has come and is coming in the person of your son, Jesus Christ. And we praise you that you are good. In Jesus' name. Amen.